Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. I don't know. I hope he. I hope he got some sleep. I hope he went. He didn't. Yeah. Oh yeah. He'd be in trouble if he didn't make that. Call the meeting into order. Mr. Carter, I think you have the invocation and the pledge. I do. Thank you. Join me in prayer, folks. Father God, as we gather together before you, deliberating the business for the citizens of Alamance County, we seek your guidance, your leadership, your control, help the meditations of our heart, our mind, the words of our mouths be acceptable in your sight, dear Lord. Watch over and protect us as we go through this day. Bring us some dry weather, dear Lord. I'll just add that in too. We ask these things, dear Lord, in the powerful and holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Secretary, I only believe we have two speakers. Are they on topic or are they just public speakers? Do you know? Okay, so we have um, we have one speaker who signed up to speak on a non-agenda item. The second person that signed up did not specify. So I don't know if we have anybody over in overflow. Just a second, y'all. Let's check. We just have one on the line. And then we have one caller on the line and some written comments. Are you a speaker? Um, anybody here a speaker that came over? Thomas Hicks. Mr. Hicks. Thomas Hicks. Okay, there is no speaker from over there or here. Okay. So if we can go to the caller on the line. And now I've got two. Two. Good evening, you're connected to the county commissioner's meeting. If you could state your full name, address, and county of residence and topic you're speaking on, please. Um, my name is Tommy Hicks. I live at 1730 Quaken Bush Road, Snow Camp, North Carolina in Alamance County. And I am speaking on a land use issue. Brand new Manager, uh, we have a speaker um, generally on zoning. Uh, we need to decide whether that's on topic or whether that's a general speaker. Well, we have the presentation of land use by the uh, by Professor David Owens. So I mean, we could we could, if you wanted to, allow the gentleman to go ahead and speak, just because we put the um, land use regulation item on. So if the the chair and the board are willing. Uh, you could you could define him as a speaker for on agenda items. I would say, board, if you agree, this is on topic. Does everyone agree? I do. Yes. All right, Mr. Hicks, please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, members of the commission. On January 11, 2018, under our heavy industrial and development ordinance, uh, Alamance County issued an intent to construct permit for a blast mine in Snow Camp, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Since that time, local residents have raised numerous issues to the Board of Commissioners concerning our health and safety. These concerns include the close proximity of the mine to Colonial's hazardous material pipelines and surrounding properties dependent on groundwater. In addition to those concerns, we identified obvious differences in the site plan submitted to the state for a mining permit and the one that was submitted to the county. 
We also identified apparent inconsistencies of both site plans with certain requirements of the HIDO. In response to our concerns, in October of 2019, the Board of Commissioners voted to engage a third-party attorney to review the HIDO permit issued to Snow Camp Property Investment Investments, and this review was completed by Craig Justice of the Van Winkle Law Firm and was released to the public uh, in January of this year. It discloses a number of apparent inconsistencies with the requirements in the HIDO, as you pointed out, including differences in the state and county site plans and an issue with land spacing. Mr. Justice recommended to send the permit applicant and Alamance aggregates a written notice to respond to these issues and to collect more facts. To date, no such notice has been sent. In November of this, of this past year, the uh, Department of Environmental Quality issued a mining permit to Alamance aggregates for the Snow Camp Mine, which is posted on its website. The site approved by the state barely resembles the site plan upon which the county issued the county permit. Construction is underway at the site despite the HIDO requirement that any changes or amendments to an approved site plan but prior to construction must be submitted to the planning department for review and approval. <clears throat> the state mining permit uh, provides that under our statutes that the issuance of a mining permit does not supersede or otherwise affect or prevent the enforcement of any zoning regulation or ordinance duly adopted by an incorporated city or county. Mr. Justice concluded that the HIDO grants broad relief to the planning director to address any illegal work. Nevertheless, our planning department has yet to issue any notice to the permit holder to request review of the amended site plan or of any of the issues noted in Mr. Justice's report. If we do not enforce our ordinances, then we risk losing what little protection they afford our communities. I'm asking that you request the planning department to notify Alamance aggregates and Snow Camp property investments of the need for the review of the amended site plans and to respond to the outstanding issues included in Mr. Justice's review. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, the speakers, uh, Mr. Carter, but I think yours is off to, uh, the agenda, so yeah. we'll call on you at the end of the meeting. Should I go back to the other room? No. Wherever you're, I'm. Okay. Plenty, plenty of space here, Absolutely. Mr. Okay. Chairman. Okay, I'm Thank going you. to catch in the next caller. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that was a different call. Good evening. You're connected to the county commissioner's meeting. If you could state your full name full address and county of residence. Yes, good evening. My name is Omar Bautista and I live in Burlington, North Carolina, 1717 Durham Street in Alamance County. And I have spoken, oh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, what's your topic, sir? Um, the, uh, the uh, renewal of the contract with ICE. Okay. You may start your three minutes. All right. Thank you. As I was saying, I have spoken in front of you before to share the story of when I spent 10 months locked up in a cage, separ separated from my family in great part because of the agreement that Terry, Terry Johnson has with ICE. It didn't matter that I was in the country legally, that I had kids to feed, nor that I was never convicted of a crime. This is just, this is just what happens when you give Terry Johnson the resources and the free range to do as he pleases. But you all already know this and yet have continued to enable him. Not only have you refused to end the contract with ICE and are now getting ready to renew it? We are talking about spending it over by a million dollars. Expansion is the right thing to do when, the, when business is going well. What is wrong is making a business out of tearing families apart. And that is exactly what Terry Johnson is doing by proxy 
this is what the county commission is doing as well. But let's just pretend for a second that there is nothing inhumane, unchristian about profiting from leaving children parentless. It is really wise to spend an additional million dollars to rip apart families in the middle of a pandemic. When so many people in, in businesses are struggling to consider expanding the jail's budget to separate more families, just seems like a bad, bad business decision. When schools have been un underfunded for years and people are choosing to move out of the out of the country seeking better conditions for their children. Maybe expanding the budget of the jail is a poor business decision. So I am here to ask you not to expand the sheriff's budget. In fact, I am here to ask you that you don't renew the contract with ICE. This community does not need it. It does not want it. And there are so many more important needs those resources can go forward to. Thank you. Thank you. Did he give his address? Yep, 1717 Drum Street. Okay. What was his name? I didn't catch uh, it. Omar Bautista. Omar. <coughs> he's, he's been here. Beg your pardon? Omar Bautista. Thank you. He, he's been in front. Bruce Arden anymore. Okay, we had received a lot of written comments, but due to the limitations, I'll only be able to read three of those. Two are in opposition of the budget amendment, and the third is in support of the budget amendment. Are you ready? Yes, first, first one is from Caitlin Fields of 2205 Roger Street. The Sheriff's Department budget should not be increased. They should not be rewarded for profiting from a racist system. The next one is from Carrie Griffin of Graham. Good evening, commissioners. When you ask most people what they love about living in Alamance County, a common response is the people. This is true for myself too. I love the rich tapestry of folks from all walks of life that call this county home. Yet not all of the people who live here feel safe or welcomed in large part due to the sheriff's partnership with ICE. I am writing to say two things. Do not approve the sheriff's amended budget. Stop exploiting people from our community <coughs> for profit. I urge you to reduce funding for the sheriff's wasteful and abusive immigration enforcement activities and to exercise much needed oversight of his practices with ICE. The amended budget will only work to tear more families apart while preying on the very providers of our youth. Our entire community, including undocumented members, are vibrant, strong, and deserving. We call on you to reject any increase in funding that will exacerbate serious rights, violations in the existing immigration enforcement system, and instead abolish this partnership with ICE. And we took, we took the uh, written comments, the first ones that we received. And this is in support of the budget amendment from Jeffrey Clayton of Graham. Alamance County should be compensated for their role in the cooperation with ICE. Thank you, Terry Johnson, for <coughs> continuing to enforce the laws of our country. The United States provides ample opportunity for people with skills and experience to enter and contribute to society. Our country doesn't need more people coming here who just want to change it into what they think it should be because they don't like it. Just look at Graham. People moved here from progressive cities and then complained that it wasn't inclusive enough. It's happening on a national level too and cities have to do their part if we are to stem the flow of invaders. Keep fighting for American citizens, Terry. That is, that is it. Any other comments? 
you have. All right, thank you. The other agenda items. Commissioners, any comments? We next next need to approve the agenda. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Case unanimously. Okay, the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Again, carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, Mr. Hager, I think you're, you're up next to bat. Oh, well, good evening, commissioners. Uh, good evening. I have a request before you this evening uh, by the Alamance Community College to allocate $335,600 from the college's capital reserve fund uh, for a project uh, that involves uh, work to be done to the college's EMS education program space. And I believe at this time we have staff from the college joining us by Zoom. And uh, what I'd like to do is ask them to present you information about the project and then I'll go over the financial piece of the information uh, when they're finished talking about what it's all about. So I think I heard Dr. Gatewood uh, on the Zoom call and I think he may have some other staff with him. So Dr. Gatewood, are you with us this evening? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you to Chair Page and members of the board for the opportunity tonight to present our request. On behalf of the Elements Community College Board of Trustees, we're requesting to use $355,600 worth of capital reserve funds to upgrade, expand, and renovate our emergency medical services facilities. The Board of Trustees at their meeting on last Monday night, February 8th, approved this capital project to be funded using county capital funds. However, it requires the Board of Commissioners approval in order to move forward. I have with me tonight Matt Bainco, our Chief Financial Officer, who will answer any questions that you may have about the finances, and Tom Hartman, who is our Associate Vice President of Administrative Services, who will actually present most of the slides that we have tonight. Let me, let me just say a few things before I refer to Tom for the remainder of this presentation. And that is the Emergency Services Program provides a huge service to our county. It provides much needed education and training that consists of non-credit courses, professional licensure, and refresher, refresher courses in basic and advanced life science. Uh, sciences and life support. I should be on slide two where it's assisting with the slides, and that would be the slides that says ACC EMS program. And so, if we roll this up, what we're talking about here is the emergency medical technician program, the emergency medical responder program, and paramedics. And then we have an array of courses and refresher courses. And, and uh, certificates that come under these different programs. Enhancing the facility would make it really great, and that is what uh, Tom Hartman will talk about. He will show you, uh, give you some examples of how our facility looks now, and then also some examples of how it could look. And this matters, in this case looks matters because it is indicative of the resources we have to deliver this program. The enrollment in this program has really skyrocketed. For example, in 2017, we enrolled 426 students, which is really good in itself. But then by 2019, that enrollment had jumped to 705 students. And it's been tempered a bit by the virus, but even at the tempered state, the enrollment is still almost 600 students uh, for the year that we are in now. And so it is, again, it's an incredibly important program. The facilities we have are insufficient and cannot support the growth that we are achieving. Tom, I would defer to you now to take this presentation forward. And then again, we will answer any questions you have following Tom's presentation of the slides. 
right. Thank you, Dr. Gale. I appreciate that. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the current status of the EMS program, uh, just to give you a little bit of information on that. Uh, currently, as Dr. Gale mentioned, it's a high enrollment program. Currently, uh, we lack the dedicated space. Uh, currently, the program is in about uh, less than 3,000 square feet. It's actually housed, and you can see from the pictures there, it's housed in a four, former computer integrated machining program lab. So, that used to be our machining lab before we moved to our new building. Um, and that is now where we've housed the EMS program for about the last year and a half to two years. If you go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, Improvements are critical for the program to meet the required credentialing and the accreditation standards of the program. Uh, improved state-of-the-art lecture and technology classrooms are critical for the continued growth that Dr. David mentioned, and also increased storage capacity is needed for the large quantity of training materials. And those slides give you some examples, again, of the machining labs and how they're using that space at this point. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, the EMS program vision, uh, again, we, the, the vision for the program is that it remains at the main campus of ACC, uh, that we dedicate 6,300 square feet of space for the program, plus an additional 1,800 uh, square feet of shared space for the program. And the hope is to create simulation labs and state-of-the-art learning spaces, similar to what you see in the, the photos there. These are from other community colleges. One is a simulated emergency room, the sim labs, the simulated labs are very important to the program, as well as a simulated residence, so that the students will go through the process from going from a residence all the way to the emergency room and so on. Uh, next slide, please. And this continues with that vision. Uh, one of the options that, that, that will be part of this would be a control room for observation and critique. Basically behind that uh, two-way mirror, uh, the faculty are back there and they're instructing the students and watching them, critiquing them as they go through their, their, uh, their procedures. Also, uh, we'd we'll be looking at adding a simulated ambulance. In addition to the, the ambulance that we have, we have an ambulance that they do practice on uh, in real time uh, out on the campus. But this would be a simulated ambulance in the classroom to provide more detailed instruction and hands-on instruction. Next slide, please. And the renovation timeline, the renovation needs for the program uh, really are immediate as the EMS program has to, to um, vacate their current temporary space in the machining labs. That first floor of that building is actually going to become the ABSS Early College Program. That construction is part of our backfill program and that construction begins in mid-May. So uh, we need to move EMS out of that area and get them into their new space, which would be the second floor of that building. And the thing about the EMS program and the renovation, it complements the overall capital projects and renovations that are going on at the college, uh, including the backfill project that I mentioned, we have a culinary expansion going on, and of course all of the, uh, the bond projects that are going on. So that's something we want to move on uh, rather quickly. So with that, um, I think we could open up any questions that anyone has about the program. <coughs> Thank you, Commissioners, I'm happy to present the financial information at this time or if you had questions for the college staff about the programmatic uh, details of the project, I'm sure uh, they'd be happy to answer. Any board member have a question? I have, I have one question I'm curious to see. Have you done some projections on where you think uh, the student enrollment might go to in the next couple of years? Uh, Commissioner Carter, I, 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 I'm speculating here, but I suspect that that enrollment will certainly continue to increase, and I would not be surprised at all if we didn't reach 900 to 1,000 students. But it's becoming more and more in demand to have really, really well-trained people in the emergency services area, so I think that demand will continue to grow. How many of those students are we seeing from Alamance County and how many from surrounding counties? Do we have a breakdown on that? I do not have a breakdown with me um, tonight, but I can assure you that 
most of these students are from Alamance County. Not all of them, but most are. The thing about students coming in from out of the county is they recognize the quality of our programming, the quality of our instruction, so that it is sought after. I would also add that when students do come from outside of the county, that is revenue that the college generates in terms of the state FT reimbursement. So it's, it's a benefit to the college, which helps us to provide and even better services to the residents of our county. Thank you. Um, Dr. Gatewood, it's Pam. I know we've got the Fire Academy at ABSS, which has been extremely successful, and the EMS, thank goodness, COVID. Uh, how is that student that's going to be in that EMS Academy at ABSS, how do they filter into you, like day one when they start there? What do they bring with them as far as credits and everything? Uh, I, I don't want to overstate this. I'm, I'm not an expert in this area. But I can, I can tell you that whatever preparation they get while at ABSS certainly uh, supports and undergirds what they will do here. In other words, they may come in as more advanced students, and, and that's always helpful. They have to, in those cases, they'll spend less time with us. But again, I don't want to overstate my answer here because that's not really my area of expertise. And just one more thing, um, the Accelerated Career Program, how, many, how much, as far as numbers, is that going to be able to increase for students since you're going to have a larger area? I think it would be significant. You mean the, uh, uh, the uh, early college yeah, program? Yeah, early college. Yes, the original goal we had for the early college was around 350 students. So we should be able to certainly accommodate up to 350 at some point. And that may also require some more strategic scheduling those kinds of things but um, that was the original vision that we had for this program when we started it several years ago well i know that it's nothing but amazing when kids can graduate high school with no cost and have an associate's degree i wish that for every student thank you so much for doing that thank you well mr chairman if there are no other questions this completes our presentation and we want to thank you for all your great work. Thank Absolutely. you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Any other discussion? Do we have a motion? Wait. No. Right. I need I'm to gonna, say. Are we finished? Oh, I'm sorry. If, if the commissioners <laughs> like, I'll like go over the financial information uh, right. pertaining to this project. All right. We, we have it in our packet, so I just assume we're... <laughs> Don't seem to have a clicker. We got it, sir. Oh, that's all right. Mm -hmm. well, thanks. This is a one-slide presentation. <laughs> I might indicate to those on uh, on Zoom, we have in our packets this information, so we're not quite as jumpy as, <laughs> as we <laughs> appear. <laughs> that wasn't what I was talking about. So, <laughs> so uh, commissioners, you've heard from the college. They're requesting <laughs> to allocate $335,600 from the college's capital reserves, uh, proposing to use this to renovate space at the campus for their EMS education program. So the county holds capital reserves for the college. We currently have in our capital reserve, specifically for the community college, $6,494,484. Okay, that's all right. So those capital reserves, that's $6.4 million that is in the county's capital reserve, specifically for the college, uh, we have plans for those dollars. Uh, they are to be used for the college's current debt, the college's future debt, which is from the uh, education bond project. It's also to be used for planned CIP amounts. In our capital plan, we have certain dollar amounts for the next seven to ten years that we told the college, you can expect this much per year. Those reserves will be uh, used for that too. And we've also uh, believe that we can use these reserves, parts of them, to pay for the new ACC facility op. So you can remember when we were talking about uh, the new education bond projects at the college, we were some level of concern to make sure that in the future we had enough money to pay the operating costs for those two. We believe that the reserves are building at such a rate for the college uh, that we could use some of these reserve funds as they start coming online with these new buildings, which is good news. So where does that money come from? It comes from debt step down. So as we pay the college's debt, the way we're set up now, we put the money back into their reserves. We did that to try to keep the property tax impact 
low when we passed the property tax increase that was needed for the bonds. Also, um, I'm sure the commissioners will remember 1.4 cents of the 7.04 cent property tax increase was specifically for the community college's capital right. plan. That was education bond debt and these other um, CIP amounts. So we're building capital reserves and at this time we estimate there are $998,544 in surplus capital reserves. That means that we have built almost a million dollars more in capital reserves than we think it's going to take to pay current debt, future debt, operating costs, and their planned CIP amounts. That has happened because the college has changed some timelines on their project from when we originally set the 7.04 cent uh, property tax increase. They've moved a few of their projects back. That means debt would be delayed, so, but the reserves keep building, preparing to pay that debt. And we've also, um, our property tax base has grown more than our conservative estimate for the plan. I think for the plan, we may have estimated around 1%. We're really seeing about two to three in our property tax base. This is all good news, but it leads to additional dollars forming in the capital reserve. That is good. We want to see those capital reserves grow because we haven't issued that debt yet, right? We haven't actually started some of the major construction. So we want, it's better for us, in my opinion, to see some capital reserves building beyond what we think it will take based on our initial estimates to pay this uh, to pay this debt. So if the commissioners and, and any use of these capital reserves must be approved by the County Board of Commissioners, thus the, the college is here tonight. It's earmarked for their use, but they have to come to the commissioners and request permission to be able to use it. If the commissioners approve uh, the $335,600 for this uh, EMS space renovation, it would leave an estimated $662,944 in surplus capital reserve. That is, again, above and beyond what we think it will take to pay for all the, the debt and planned CIP. Uh, it is important to understand, too, that that 998 and that 662 is also based on our planning interest rates. When we, when we did our plan originally, we estimated 4.5% in interest rates for the bond debt. Right. I think it will be lower. I think we'll be closer to 3%, something in, those, in that area. So we'll see the capital reserves, I think, continue to grow. We won't know that bond interest rate, obviously, until we really sell and lock in. So uh, the commissioners uh, could tonight approve this if you, if you feel comfortable doing that, understanding we're using surplus capital reserves in ACC's uh, account uh, for the, uh, that the county holds. It does require a budget amendment, and, and obviously you've heard from the staff. So uh, uh, the funding is there. You know, I, I, we want to be careful with the capital reserves because we haven't gotten deep into these bigger education bond projects, and we do want to make sure we, you know, 20-year debt, we want to make sure we've got that covered, right? There's no question about that. I am encouraged that I think we could, uh, if the capital reserves are building at such a rate that I think we could also eventually use them to pay some of these operating costs when the new buildings come online. Because uh, I think we had estimated around half a million dollars a year in new operating debt from the college's new education mm -hmm. bond um, buildings, the ones they would build. So, um, the funding is there. It's all about do the commissioners feel comfortable allocating some of it now for this particular project. I, I would tell you that I think it's going to go higher than $998,000 once we lock in the actual uh, interest rate for the bonds that will sell in April. So I'll be happy to answer any questions and I see we still have the ACC folks here too. I'm, I'm sure they'll be happy to do so. I'll make a motion that we approve the request. Second. John and Chairman Paisley, I am married to Craig Thompson, who is one of the ACC Board of Trustee members, and I can I will not vote on this. I just think it's a conflict. I just uh -uh. <laughs> I don't want to be in charge of my husband's budget. <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> I just I just don't feel comfortable doing it. Uh, Chairman Paisley, should we uh, make a motion to allow her to Let, um, He's not receiving any financial benefit from this grant whatsoever. Nope. I, um, know, I know that. It's just a personal preference, if it's okay. All right, Board, do we have a motion to allow her to decrease herself? Sure, I'll make a motion. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Yeah, motion, second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion on this matter before we vote? Do we have a motion to approve this grant? We do. Mm -hmm. Had a second. Mm -hmm. 
We've got that recorded. Mm -hmm. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh -huh. All opposed? Carries again with no opposition. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Okay. Chairman and members of the board, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. For your thank great you. work. Absolutely. I think our financial officer is next up. Ms. Evans, how are you doing? Doing well. I hope you are tonight as well. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Um, I come before you tonight to request approval for us to write off EMS billing accounts totaling $2.7 million that are uncollectible because they are over three years old and all legal and cost-effective collection efforts have been exhausted. Um, by state statute, we are only allowed to go back three years um, to enforce that collection. However, even if they are written off, if someone does want to pay on an outstanding bill, we happily accept that payment. Um, and on Zoom call tonight is also Ray Vipperman. Um, so he is available if any questions come about. So just to give you a little background um, on our EMS policies and where we are. So right now, currently, Alamance County utilizes EMS MC for our billing and Rossman and Associates for our EMS collection agency. Um, prior to contracting with EMS MC in December of 2019, the county used AMB and we had many problems with their billing and collection practices. Um, so we were able to put out an RFP, which was about a eight to 10 month process. And we selected EMS MC as our new provider. Um, currently, our process is that all of our invoicing is handled by our billing company and they send out a 30 day notice and if there is no response within 30 days, they send out another notice. If there's no response in those 30 days, they send out another notice. So our patients are given 90 days on which they can pay for our bill. Um, any invoice with activity, so if someone has called in and said, I can't pay all of this at one time, but I wanna set up payment plans, um, EMS MC works with our um, patients, sets up those payment plans, and as long as there is activity, they are not turned over to a collection agency and EMS MC actively collects on that patient's account. Also, any outstanding insurance claims that are under review, EMS MC continues to claim on those until they have extinguished all collection agency at that time. Um, after those 90 days, if there is no response, then that invoice then is passed on to Rossman and Associates, our collection agency, and it's also sent to um, the North Carolina set um, debt set off program, which is a wonderful program that the state enacted several years ago that counties and municipalities, any governmental agency, if you had a citizen who owed you money, you can send that debt to their clearing house and any um, citizen who receives a state refund tax or if they win lottery winnings that are in excess of $600, then those earnings and winnings are attached first to pay back any debt that a citizen would have to a county or municipality. Um, and we are actively participating in that program as well. Um, so mainly these write-offs that are before you tonight are mostly from private pays. Um, citizens who don't have insurance cannot pay and some of them unfortunately just will not pay. Um, we are right in line with other counties collecting about 70% of the amount billed. So to just give you a little bit of prior write-off history, in 2019, the county wrote off $534,938.63, which was for the period of January through December of 2015. And in that same year, we collected $4 million, just slightly over $4 million that year. In 2016, which is the request that's before you tonight, um, we do pick up a little bit of 2015. Um, you know, I just spoke a few minutes ago about we had some problems with AMB. They did not write off everything that they should have in that first year. Um, this also picks up our business relationship with Rossman and Associates. So we're going back and taking off um, write offs for 2015. 2016 and 2017, which totals up to our $2.7 million. In fiscal year 16, um, the write-offs total 580,000, and in that year we received $4.3 million. And in fiscal year 17, we're asking to write off 1.5 million, and we received 4.4 million in revenue that year. So if there are any other questions that 
the board has, I'll answer them as best as I can, or if it's more collection as far as ridership, then Ray's available to answer those questions as well. I have a question pertaining to the Medicaid. A lot of these, as I understand it, are required write-offs anyway that we don't have a choice. <laughs> that is true, and I spoke with Ray this afternoon, and our billing company, and Ray, you say if I misspeak, is that our billing company is able to go ahead and adjust those bills at the time of billing and whenever they receive that Medicaid payment back. That's correct. And they just, you know, Medicaid pays what they pay, and then you can't balance bill the patients, you can't do anything else with those bills. So they write that off as a contractual allowance, uh, which, you know, is equivalent to a write-off. Uh, but they tend to do that on the front end. And so we only average about $121.81 of revenue uh, for a Medicaid transport, uh, which is significantly lower than the Medicare or private uh, insurer counterparts. And that Medicaid write-off is part of this package right here no sir it is the, not. no sir the no. Um, billing company is able to go ahead and contractually adjust those bills down on the front end instead of the write-off one thing that when Ray and I were talking this afternoon one thing that we're seeing as more of a trend is as employers are offering more of a high deductible insurance plan and employees are taking that plan it puts more responsibility on the employee to pay for their health insurance or their health claims and so he's seeing a rise in private pays that are going unpaid. I have a question. What kind of money are we having to pay as a county to these people that does this collection? Um, Ray, I'll let you speak to that because the contract. Yeah, so we collect, uh, we um, pay them 4.5% of what they collect. So it's not, you know, if they don't collect anything, we wouldn't pay them anything. And so it kind of incentivizes them to try to collect as much revenue as they can uh, because that ups what they're paid uh, from the county. And one other thing, like no matter if, how many times someone calls, we go. If it's the same person, regardless if they've got a, an account that's open. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of sickness. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that the new billing company had to write off some bad debt that the old billing company mm -hmm. failed to write off. If you account for that, do you have a sense of, of if you compare year over year, how the uh, how the bad debt is increasing? It seems to be increasing quite a bit. It is increasing. Um, and so I will say that we have one more year with the old uh, billing company. Um, so we should see probably about the same amount in next year's write-off that we would bring. Um, granted, I would say not 2.7 million because if you look at just fiscal year 17, we're looking at about 1.5 million. So that trend could possibly continue. One thing I will say is that our Rossman and Associates, um, our collection agency, they do a really good job with what they what they do um, they will work and set up payment plans with patients as well they send out what they call a soft enforcement letter first of all just to introduce themselves and say we're a collection agency collecting on behalf of alamance county if there is no response then they are able to attach that debt to the person's credit report um, so they are actively uh, working those cases and we have worked with them since fiscal year 2018 and we we have seen them be able to collect um, one hundred forty thousand dollars on our behalf since that time. Uh, you meant it's a four percent collection rate? Is that a, a payment on the one for the EMS MC for Rossman and Associate Ray? It's is it twenty five percent? I think it's thirteen percent for the soft billing and nineteen percent for the hard collections. Okay. And like Susan said, it. We give them another 90 days, so once it goes to collections, they get three more statements, and that's on the soft collection, so that does not impact credit. If they set up payment plans at that point, it will never go over to hard collections mm -hmm. as long as they don't miss any payments. But then once it goes over to hard collections, I think it's there for another 120 days, and at that point, if it's not collected, uh, it goes to North Carolina debt set off, and that's where it resides. Um, and then, you know, sometimes you have accounts that are five, six years old where somebody will win the lottery or they'll get a state tax return and then that'll, that'll pay that debt uh, that they owe the county. 
Do we have the ability to uh, enter judgments in this debt? Um, so we do. It is one of our options. Um, with the issues that we had with A and B, we decided that it was in our citizens' best interest not to do that because the billing that they had done was so confused and messed up that we decided let's get through everything with A and B and then once all of that is extinguished then we can take a stricter enforcement of these collections. Might also indicate as an attorney and uh, back in the day of biomedical laboratories which later turned into race and then lab where I was doing a lot of collection work nationwide for them. Uh, you get into small bills, mm -hmm. filing fees, all kinds of thrown away costs mm -hmm. if you go after these small, small amounts. Now if they're large amounts, but EMS is not going to have a large uh, an amount likely large enough to file litigation over. Uh, but if you do and get a judgment, then you can do in North Carolina what's called a supplemental procedure and actually bring the uh, the debtor in and question them about assets and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But to make that cost efficient or effective rather, uh, you all you would have to have a pretty sizable debt. You would not do that over a one ambulance bill by no. any means. Mm -hmm. So this debt is like a lot of volume it of is. calls and um, and and like this like all these numbers you gave us, where what would that money go to help if we had it? So if those monies were collected, it offsets the EMS budget. Mm -hmm. So their revenues offset their expenses and it would just give them greater capacity. And so we could, if we had all this, we could probably buy additional buses like ambulances and have more staff if we need it and maybe located in Mebane instead of just all in this area, we could use that. And, uh, and just a side note with, um, COVID, and I know um, crime hadn't stopped, drug abuse hadn't stopped, nothing stopped because of COVID except us having to work and stuff. Um, just just make sure we always know that no matter what's going on with COVID, EMS always goes out. That's correct. Again, all those, this looks like a tremendous amount of money. There's small, small debts typically, is that correct? That's correct. I did a quick um, average and Rossman had about 6,000 tickets that they would be writing off this debt and it averaged out to $325.67 per ticket. Yeah. And court cost filing fee alone. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat that average again? Sure. $325.67. You're welcome. Yeah. I do have another question. I'll make a motion. We approve the request. Uh, he has one more question. Excuse me. Oh. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. sorry. I didn't I just want to get sorry. some numbers up. You mentioned uh, in 2017, I want to go back through these numbers again if mm -hmm. you can. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you had $1.5 million in uh, bad and 4.4 collected? Yes. Okay. Can you give me the number in 2016 and 2018 if you have it? Sure. 2016. Um, we we had a total write-off of 580,763.18, and we received 4.3, almost 4.4 million that year as well. And then 2018, we're not requesting that to be written off tonight, okay. so I don't have those figures in front of me tonight. But I can get those to you, Commissioner no Lashley. No worries. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. It just shows you that 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 takes away from other things mm -hmm. that are very important. That's two point seven million dollars, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Okay, motion to approve the request. I'll second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Uh, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ray. I think we have our wonderful Professor David Owens uh, next. Is he on? Yep. There he is. Professor good, good evening. Good evening. I understand you're an attorney, you're a professor, uh, you're pretty much uh, everything all rolled into one. And we appreciate your helping us out. <laughs> 
Uh, delighted to be with you br briefly tonight. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the uh, commission, uh, what I thought I would do is just do a very quick overview on some a few zoning issues. Uh, I was with you a couple of years ago. I understand you moved along a little further on consideration of zoning issues. So I thought I'd introduce that, see if you've got any questions about that, and also briefly talk about development moratoria and what your options are there. I understand some questions have, have come up about how you can use that tool if, if you wanted to do that. Uh, so I would address those two issues and be happy to uh, address anything else you would like to talk about relative to development regulation and zoning. Uh, but I will be relatively brief and give you a quick overview and then see if you've got any questions or thoughts about this that I can help you with. Does that sound reasonable? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, well, I think uh, I will have this PowerPoint here. Uh, you can't, although I'm not physically leaving Chapel Hill. I can't virtually leave Chapel Hill without a PowerPoint. Uh, a couple of quick slides for you uh, just to get started. Um, quick reminder on zoning. There, there are a lot of things you can do with zoning if you decide to go that route. There are other things uh, you cannot do. The main reason you would look at zoning uh, in addition to or replacing or incorporating the existing ordinances you have like cell tower, mobile home park, uh, heavy industry and other types of development regulation is to consolidate all of these development regulations into one place, have a common set of definitions, administrative procedures and what zoning adds to the mix is that you can have with different zones differential standards for different types of the county. So, and the main thing that allows you to do is to address compatibility of adjacent land uses. You may decide, for example, if you have a residential area that you do not want heavy industry immediately adjacent to an industrial or entirely within a residential area. Or you may have other areas that are especially well suited for industrial development or heavy development and you don't want to allow single family homes to come in and use the limited amount of space you've got available uh, for that issue because of the use conflicts that invariably arise in that situation. So the main reason most local governments have used zoning is to address this whole question of compatibility of adjacent land uses and make sure that one person's use of a property is not unduly harming uh, their neighbors. Efficient provision of infrastructure is another important uh, dimension to consider. Uh, some places have water and sewer, some places don't, uh, and that has an impact on what uses are appropriate there, or rail, highway access, that sort of thing. With major public investments in infrastructure, making sure that's efficiently used is an important dimension of zoning. Uh, protection of public health and safety issues, noise, emissions, uh, vibration, all of those sorts of things are legitimate factors to consider uh, in using zoning. Uh, protecting property values. Uh, one of the reasons zoning has been very popular in North Carolina over the years is many private property owners want to be sure that their neighbors are not using their property in a way that might be legal but will be otherwise injurious to their property values uh, and protecting neighborhood property values uh, and balancing individual property rights is certainly a legitimate factor to think about with zoning counties uh, I, I think I showed you this map a couple of years ago it hasn't changed much in the last two years the counties in blue are the counties with countywide zoning. The counties in red, well, that's 69 of our counties have now gone to countywide zoning. Uh, the counties in red have partial county zoning, parts of their areas are zoned, and the counties in white are the counties without county zoning. Almost all of those counties have municipal zoning within the counties, but county government uh, has not adopted zoning in those 19 uh, counties shown in white. Counties have the option that cities do not have. If a city adopts zoning, it has to be applied throughout the entire city. Counties have the option of zoning all of your unincorporated area or only part of it. A county cannot do any zoning inside of a city unless the city asks for that. 
and that includes the city's extraterritorial area. But the county can zone any unincorporated area or any part of it. So if you wanted to zone just the area covered by a small area plan and leave the rest of the unincorporated area unzoned, you certainly have that option. There used to be a requirement that the county zone, at, if you had any partial county zoning, that it be at least 640 acres, a minimum. But that minimum was repealed uh, with the adoption of Chapter 160D last year. So now the county can pick as large or small an area as you deem appropriate. <clears throat> On moratorium, a moratorium is constitutional. Uh, as long as it is not too long. A key fact when you're thinking about a moratorium, if you want to go that route, is how long should it be? And our U.S. Supreme Court said as long as, as it is less than a year, it's almost conclusively deemed to be um, constitutional, not a taking of private property rights to put a temporary hold on development of property. But it can't be too long. And that also leads to our statutory authority in North Carolina. Our statute says you can do a moratorium on any development approval required by law. Now, one important fact in this statement is that you can't just do a moratorium and say no development. It's a moratorium on an approval. So if no approval is required, then you can't do a moratorium on it. You do the moratorium on approving various types of development. So you have to have something in place that requires a development approval because that's what you're putting the moratorium on. You're not processing and approving any applications during the term of the moratorium. If you adopt moratorium, you have to do a public hearing unless there's a, an imminent threat to public health and safety. Uh, the published notice depends on how long the moratorium is. If it's more than 60 days, you have to do two published notices. Uh, the first notice at least 10 days, but not more than 25 days prior to the effective date of the moratorium. And the second notice in a separate calendar week. So that's the, the notice of the hearing on adoption of a moratorium. Very importantly, our legislature said whenever you do a moratorium, you have to adopt a written statement at the time you approve the moratorium that addresses each of these four points. You have to say why you need a moratorium. Why are we doing this? We need this because uh, we don't have any regulations on adult entertainment siting and we would like to put those regulations in place before any of those businesses come into being. Or whatever. You explain why it is you need this. Explain why an alternative to the moratorium is inadequate. Um, specify the scope and duration of the moratorium. That is exactly what does it apply to. Does it apply to building permits, subdivision plats, permits for industrial development? Specify exactly what it covers and how long it's going to last. Whether this could be 90 days, 180 days, a year. Um, and then fourthly explain what you're going to do during the moratorium to address why you imposed it. Uh, the example I gave you earlier, uh, I had a small town in western North Carolina that had no adult entertainment regulations and somebody had proposed converting uh, an existing restaurant to a topless bar just informally talked about it and they said whoa we need a moratorium on this because we need to think about what can we do, what should we do. We need some legal analysis, we need a plan, uh, and we need six months to sort of consult with our attorney, solicit public comment, uh, consider a regulation, and put it into place before applications come in uh, of that nature. Um, so you just explain, this is what we're going to do during the six months or 12 months of the moratorium. Um, those four things you have to do at the beginning. You can't do it after the fact. You have to do that at the time you adopt the moratorium or before that, put it in writing, and the entire board has to approve that statement. There are a couple of things that moratoria do not apply to. 
And these are important to keep in mind in terms of whether a moratorium is appropriate in an individual circumstance. This first one is perhaps the most important. If a complete application has been submitted for a required development approval prior to the effective date of the moratorium, the permit choice rule applies. And what the permit choice rule is, is a statute that says, if I've got a complete application and you put my application on hold because there's a moratorium, when the moratorium expires, I can choose to be covered either by the prior rule or the new rule. So your moratorium, if the purpose of your moratorium is to get a new rule into effect, if somebody has a completed application in prior to the effective date of the moratorium, they can choose to be covered by the old rule rather than the new rule you adopted at the conclusion of the moratorium. So that's an important factor to think about in terms of whether a moratorium is going to be effective for the reasons you need it. it similarly, it does not apply to a subdivision plat approval if a complete plat approval application is already in prior to the effective date of the moratorium. You cannot do a moratorium on residential land uses, single family or multifamily, if the purpose of the moratorium is to update a plan or a regulation. Now, if the purpose of the moratorium is to provide adequate wastewater treatment or water services or fire services or something along those lines, mm -hmm. yes. But if the purpose is, well, we don't have an adequate regulation on mobile home parks or multifamily housing, we need a moratorium in this area on uh, residential development so we can develop a better plan or a new regulation, uh, that you cannot do. Uh, lastly, if somebody already has a vested right to development, a moratorium does not extinguish their vested right. Uh, you may be able to put their right on hold during the moratorium, but at the conclusion of the moratorium, they can resume and carry on uh, whatever they have a vested right, a legally established vested right to do. And then the last point I'd make about moratoria is that your ability to extend the moratorium is very limited. So if you adopt a moratorium for six months and at the end of five months you said, well, we really needed nine months, uh, there are strict limitations on your ability to add another three months to the end of the moratorium. So if you do decide to think about that, you should probably err on the side of making the moratorium long enough to do what you need to do and then shorten it if, if that's feasible or if you finish up your work early. But it's a lot easier to shorten a moratorium than it is to extend it once you have adopted it. So that's a, a quick overview of moratoria, a quick overview of some zoning issues. Uh, be glad to answer any questions or help you with anything else that I can. I just have a question on your map. It showed all the, the colors of the ones who have and have not. Um, I noticed the mountain section the far west was white as far as that particular zone color and then a lot of the coastal was that white zone color. Is that just for geography reasons or what? what is yes. behind that? Okay. And, well, there we, the, and there we sit right in the middle, that little white box. <laughs> I must have killed him. Oh, no, growth, uh, the, the adoption of county zoning would match up to that very closely. Mm -hmm. uh, those white counties on the coast or in the intercoastal plain are very rural counties, uh, and, and most of them are losing population rather than gaining population. So for the most part, there's not any growth and development to regulate. And the same is largely true in the far west. With the additional owned by the National Park Service or National Forest, and most of the developable land is in municipalities rather than in the counties. So there's not a whole lot of privately owned uh, land in the unincorporated areas 
in those mountain counties that is suitable for development. Counties have elected not to uh, proceed with zoning. Alamance County is, as you know, uh, the one most populous county we have in the Piedmont that does. I, I would note that many of the things addressed by zoning, Alamance County is addressed with individual ordinances. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, Professor Owens, Craig Turner. Uh, if you assume that zoning is implemented, what procedural options does a county have to allow citizens to challenge the zoning of their particular parcel? For the most part, as a practical matter, that is usually done prior to adoption and that the county would propose a zoning map for a small area or the part of the county you're going to zone and put the ordinance with your regulations and the zoning map, which district you're putting in, out for public review and comment and have an extended period of time for people to make those comments prior to adoption. Uh, Buncombe County, for example, just adopted uh, countywide zoning for the first time about five years ago in Buncombe County, and they had their map out for several months and said, this is what we're thinking of doing and allowed each individual citizen uh, to comment on that, send in their comment, and look at that really on a parcel by parcel basis with individual citizens, and then sent those comments to the planning board for review and comment, the staff reviewed it, and the commissioners ultimately adopted something with that kind of input. Um, once you adopt it, uh, the, the legal recourse a citizen would have would generally be to come in and ask you to amend the zoning for their property, to do a rezoning, to say I would like my property at 431 East 41st Street to be rezoned from residential to commercial. Um, legal, going to court to challenge it is, is not something that's very practical in the sense that unless the county's zoning is arbitrary and capricious, uh, the court's not going to second guess the judgment of how property should be zoned. That's largely a judgment for the county commissioners to make when you adopt or amend the regulation. But citizen, after the zoning is implemented, the citizen could seek a variance or a special use permit to change their particular parcel's designation? and do that not in court but through the planning process yes yes and, and it's intended to not require people to go to court uh and there are two different very different types of things to change one is to change the zoning designation itself that's a rezoning amending the zoning the zoning map is part of your zoning ordinance so to amend the zoning map the citizen asked for that rezoning uh, that goes to the staff, does a review, it goes to the planning board for review and comment, and then it comes to the county commissioners, and the county commissioners must hold a public hearing. Prior to amending that, you send a letter to the property owner, to all of the adjacent property owners, notifying them of the hearing so you get lots of public input on that. But ultimately, it's a judgment call by the county commissioners as to whether it was zoned appropriately the first time or whether it should be amended uh, in response to that uh, landowner request. So it's largely a policy choice for the commissioners with the input from the neighbors and from the uh, planning board as well as your staff. Now a special use permit is an entirely different proposition. That's where you say we would like to allow a certain type of development provided it meets the conditions specified in the ordinance. And that's a judicial type hearing, which you can assign to the planning board, the board of adjustment, or to the county commissioners. But that's not a legislative policy judgment. When you hold a hearing there, you're gathering evidence as to are the standards in the ordinance met. So for example, a standard might be, would it cause a significant adverse impact on neighboring property values? So you would have testimony from witnesses as to whether or not that project would cause property value damages. And it's a very formal court-like proceeding for a special use permit. Similarly, a variance, somebody's coming and saying, 
Uh, I want to do something that's not allowed by the regulation, but I would have uh, practical difficulties, uh, an unnecessary hardship if I had to comply with the regulation. And there's something unique about my property that you should let me have an exception to the general rules. And again, that's a judicial type proceeding that's generally handled by the planning board or the board of adjustment. Thank you. If we uh, should um, zone at some point a portion of the county, a partial zoning, how difficult is it to, one, undo that if that happens, or can it be undone? And secondly, um, how difficult is it to then later zone additional parts of the county? Uh, both of those are relatively straightforward. You can undo it by simply amending the ordinance to repeal it. It simply requires the same kind of notice and hearing you use to adopt it. So you would, if you wanted to repeal the zoning, you would simply uh, propose that, call a public hearing, do two published notices, send it to the planning board for review and comment, and then the commissioners would vote on it. It would probably, as a practical matter, take you 60 to 90 days to go through the notice and hearing pr process, but it can be undone uh, just as quickly, perhaps more quickly than doing it in the first place. Um, extending it to other areas is fairly common, um, but you use the same process. Most counties that have countywide zoning started with partial county zoning. Uh, some counties uh, gradually expanded it. Some have been partial for long. Chatham County, for example, zoned the eastern half of the county 30 years ago and did not zone the western half until about two years ago uh, because there was more development in the Pittsburgh area than there was in the Siler City area. So they just didn't feel like they needed zoning in the western half of the county, so they didn't do it for 30 years. Um, and ultimately the citizens came in and said they wanted it, so the commissioners extended it. But you can leave it partial county zoning as long as you want or as quickly as you want. Um, some of the counties up by Lake Gaston, all they zone is the area around the lake. Um, they don't zone the rest of the county and haven't zoned it for 25, 30 years. But that's a policy choice for the county board of commissioners. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Professor, I'm gonna ask you something, because you mentioned a certain type of business that would involve clothing and things. Um, years ago, we used to have a place where um, it was out on 87, out in the country, out in the country, I mean out in the country, and it was uh, entertainment, um, you know, with all kind of stuff that you wouldn't want to go. And there was a lot of crime there, shootings, blah, blah, blah. And um, we don't have zoning, and that plopped right in the middle of a very rural community. Church right up the street, everything, and it was a real hot spot for the neighbors. It was just... My sheriff's sitting here, and he knows exactly what I'm talking about. And anyway, um, I, had, I had a member of the child, and never mind. Anyway, if we don't have zoning, something like that can just pop up anywhere. But if we do have zoning, do they have to get permission, and we can say no, for something like that to come here? Yes, yeah, if, if you don't have zoning, then they can do it wherever wherever they want. Uh, if you had zoning, you could you could put do, you could prohibit it altogether in certain districts. Say this is a residential district and we're only gonna allow single family residences, duplexes, places of worship, daycare center, whatever. You, you do the list, whatever you think is appropriate for that rural crossroads communities. And then other things, I know uh, one county, it was a, a stump dump. Somebody had a inner debris landfill that was bringing in lots of dump trucks and the noise and the dust in a very rural crossroads communities. And the neighbor said, you, we're literally being the dump because we don't have any zoning that l limits these inner debris landfills in our part of the county or a nightclub or you know some other use that would cause a problem for the neighbor. So when you craft the ordinance, you say which land uses you want to allow, and you can prohibit everything else, or you can have a specific list of the other things 
you do not want to allow you could say no commercial uses at all or just no nightclubs um, you know in some areas it's the uh, here in Orange County you probably saw we uh, having a wrestling with uh, a very large gas station uh, truck stop sort of thing by the, the interstate and a lot of the neighbors felt like you know a gas station is not a problem but one of these mega truck stops uh, would be a problem for our, our neighborhood but that's where the county commissioners get involved in saying how much is too much in that area and consulting with the neighbors and deciding what's appropriate for that particular area the limitation for counties is that you cannot regulate uh, bona fide farming through zoning. Agriculture is exempt from county zoning. That includes raising animals, road crops, aquaculture, horticulture, agritourism. Um, we had a situation in Orange County similar to the one you talked about. It said it was a somebody bought a abandoned farm and built a barn that was to be used as an event space, not as a farm thing, but just host, hosting parties, uh, wedding receptions, uh, down a small dirt road, and the neighbors in the immediate vicinity were not happy. Uh, they were, were very unhappy with this, you know, 200 person event space being located in the midst of their very rural uh, community. Um, and if it were a commercial venture, it is subject to county zoning. That particular owner tried to get around it by contending it was agritourism. Uh, the challenge was that it hadn't been farmed for 50 years, and they built a barn for the sole purpose of hosting events. Um, a dispute that was in court for about four years. Oh and it's God. still in part in court. Well, I just want to add on one thing. Allegedly, if you have a place existing now, right in the middle of like a very busy intersection, what I consider town, and it sells all kind of pornography and all kind of everything that goes with that, no matter what. Okay, we're not zoned, so there it is. If we zone, can we write somewhere in our zoning that we can't have stuff like that? Yes, you, you can. Uh, th there are limits to that. Uh, most zoning ordinances say if you were here, lawfully here, before we adopted our regulation, you can stay. But it becomes a non-conformity. They cannot enlarge it or expand it or change it. You do have the option of phasing out those non-conformities. That's primarily done with signs. In order to be fair to new businesses, you want eventually the old businesses to come into compliance with your regulation and have the same sign restrictions that everybody else has. So you give them two or three years or four years to come into compliance. But that can also be done with particular types of businesses. Um, Greensboro did that with adult businesses. Uh, they had a lot of massage parlors, adult bookstores, and other things, particularly concentrated along Lee Street, if you've uh, driven that area. And they wanted to limit those, so they gave them a couple of years once they adopted their separation requirements for adult businesses and said, you can stay there another year or two to recoup your investment, but after that, you've got to relocate to a more appropriate location. So that's been done some with sweepstakes parlors, right. uh, adult entertainment, and some things like that. But you have to give them a little bit of time to recoup their investment in order to be fair to their property owner. But after they're recouped, you cannot, they can just leave? Yes. Okay. But Professor Owens, most of those, like Lee Street, for example, is governed by Greensboro City, not, yes. not Guilford County. And that's going Absolutely. to be our case pretty much on I-85 and I-40, yeah. obviously one road all the way east to west. Um, almost exclusively that's within uh, municipalities, and so we'll have little or actually no zoning yeah. capabilities uh, along that quarter. Yes, that's, that's true. This county has no zoning authority within the corporate limits or within the city's extraterritorial jurisdiction. I think the location that Ms. Thompson was 
Uh, that's been years and years ago, hasn't it? What? Uh, Which one? That had the club or whatever it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Terry. And it was, I think, outside of the municipality, but that's that's an oddity. Yeah. Yeah, Onslow County had that. Uh, Jacksonville <laughs> tightened up its regulations, and a lot of the businesses Jacksonville was regulating moved out to Onslow County. Uh, so. Once the city tightened up its regulations, if the county did not have any, you might see the same sort of thing. Onslow County had to go back and update their regulations uh, so they didn't get the problems just moving from the city out to the county. Right. Adult entertainment. That's what I was trying to think of. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Commissioners, any other questions? Mr. Chairman, I have a question that's related to this matter, but it's for Ms. Cattle, who's, uh, I see she's on the Zoom call. Would it be appropriate for me to ask her a question that's related? Mm -hmm. I think so. Huh. Uh, Ms. Cattle, we we talked at the last meeting, well, that the commissioners approved um, the, the small land use, uh, what we call it option A for zoning in snow camp. Um, I asked about option C, which is what the planning board recommended. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Um, was the planning board specific about the purpose for its recommendation on option C? So the discussion the planning board had for option C being overlays was that there was a concern that if there is zoning put into the snow camp area, mapping out where the snow camp area plan is, that it could push development outside of that area that would have come there and that an overlay district for major arterials and just transportation purposes where we see the most growth would be maybe of importance to cover any extra growth that was going to be pushed and would make sure we control that growth. Was the planning board specific about what an overlay might look like, the overlay that it was recommending? No, there was no specifics talked about at that point. Um, would, did the planning board mention the type of overlay that, it, that the county that it was recommending to the commissioners? No, there was a suggestion that's in the land development plan about agricultural preservation for an overlay. That was one of the things that was considered, but the discussion included all of the above. Um, I want to indicate to the general public, uh, Ms. Cavill is our planning director. Uh, we're not going to outside parties. Sorry, Continue, Mr. Chairman. I should, I should have mentioned that. Um, can you describe for the for the board what an overlay is? So an overlay feels very different than just a blanket zoning or zoning a specific area like a snow camp area. An overlay just covers a specific what you would call transportation corridor. If that's what we're looking at that would protect this very specific area. It could be a mile or two wide and anything outside that overlay that isn't already zoned wouldn't be touched. It would still be unzoned. So you can do an agricultural overlay to protect current agricultural uses, or you can do a overlay along major corridors to protect residential or commercial development and kind of guide that development for the future. Um, Mr. Jim, I, I, didn't, I didn't speak to any of the commissioners about this, but I, I'd like to, I'd like to propose a motion. Um, I'd like to propose that, that the county commissioners direct the planning board to identify those land areas within the county's jurisdiction that are most suited for agricultural use and that are most suited for industrial use, but that are outside the small area plan that we identified the last meeting. Simply that they identify those areas to give the county commissioners more information about how we might proceed. Could I also ask that you include in that uh, the agricultural areas that would not be affected by zoning uh, that are in that snow camp district that we previously identified? I don't know if uh, I would I thought the zoning for the small area plan would uh, would obviate the need for that. It well, may. I got, it, it could. We can't zone. It likely would, but we can pull a map together to kind of show that because we'll probably pull a map together faster than we can do the zoning ordinance. 
Right. What I'm asking is identify those areas that would not be affected by our, our zoning. Yes, I think that would be appropriate as well, and I would add that to the motion. Thank you. That would not be affected. I'm, would, I'm asking. I'm just trying to clarify. Do you say would or would not? Well, either way. I mean, it would, it would cover either way. If, if it would be effective, that we also identify those that would not by virtue of the fact that the rest of it was done. Right. Right. Yeah. Commissioners, anything else? We're not, except well, on emotion. this matter, uh, we're, we're not having a vote on zoning, obviously, but uh, does anybody have any other statement about the motion that's on the we table right now? We have a second, do we? I'll Is second it? that motion. Okay. I think, however, we can really be the most prepared without stuck on one particular thing and then like two weeks later, oh no, we really should have thought about this. I, I think that you can't help but win on that. So good job. Good I just, I just want the large landowners, the farmers or whatever, to know whether they would or would not be impacted if we in fact do this, uh, if they continue farming. I think it just gives the commission the most information that we can have on how to Correct. proceed, regardless of what we decide. Any other discussion? All in favor of Mr. Turner's motion, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Your motion carries. Mr. Secretary, do you need for him to repeat that motion? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I move that the county commissioners direct the planning board to identify the land areas within the county's jurisdiction that are best suited for agricultural use and that are best suited for industrial use for those areas that are outside the small area plan and also identify those parcels within the small area plan that would not be affected by zoning in the small area plan. Right. I agree. Mm -hmm. Madam Secretary, you have that? Mm -hmm. And everyone agrees on this board that that is the motion they voted on, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Mr. Hagan, anything else on this, pro this portion? No, I think uh, we all would appreciate uh, County Attorney Albright lining up Professor Owens to come. Thank you very much, Clyde. Um, appreciate I, that. I owe Professor Owens a lot, and I thank him for appearing tonight. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. We're very appreciative to the professor for attending and uh, giving us a very good presentation. Mm -hmm. And Professor Owens, I truly, Mr. Short and I both as attorneys really appreciate what you presented. Thank you. Certainly. If I can ever be of any help, let, just let me know. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you to Ms. Cato as well. Oh, absolutely. She's, she's always <laughs> she's awesome. professional and always knows her stuff. <laughs> okay. We have our budget amendments. Nope. Uh, morning, morning, Mr. Chair. We have a health director. Health department. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Health Director, otherwise known as Tony. <laughs> Good evening, Chairman Paisley, Vice Chair Carter, Commissioners. Um, so first and foremost, I want to thank the staff, uh, especially last week. Last week was a cold and icy week, and their true determination and grit standing out in that weather was, was amazing just to see their passion and make sure folks got vaccinated. So truly heartfelt thanks to those staff. And thanks to our call center folks and our IT. Um, last week we had one of the highest volumes um, hit the phone system at uh, 387,000 call attempts uh, into the system trying for folks trying to get into appointments. So um, great job to those folks for trying to deliver the best customer service they can under the circumstances, quickly moving through people to get them appointments for their first dose um, shot. So I just wanna say thanks to all those, all those folks involved. Um, so today, we, um, as of last night, we had 37 cases reported. Um, this brings us to 618 active cases. I think last time I came before you, that was doubled. It was around in the 1200s that we had active cases here in Alamance County. Um, we have 18 active in the hospital and 228 deaths. 
Um, our weekly average coming in per day is about 70 cases per day now, so that continues to go down as well. Our percent positive has decreased. Again, percent positive is the positive uh, test over total test. The goal here is to get below 5%, and we've seen very significant drop over the last couple weeks. Just at the end of January, we were at our highest at 14.9%. Um, excuse me, early January we were at 14.9%, now we're down to 8%, so I hope that continues to trend down. Just slightly over 5 now, is that, is that correct? I'm sorry? Just slightly over 5% now? We're at 8% now. 8% Okay, I was looking at the blue line, sorry. Our new cases per 100,000 population over 14 days is down to 745. Uh, I think last time when I came before you was in the 800s or 1000s, some, somewhere in there. So we continue to see that drop as well. One of those measures, that's kind of how we compare ourselves to the other counties and, and states. But uh, we keep an eye on that, and that's, that's great. That's continued to drop. All right. Our state uh, report for outbreaks and clusters. Um, we currently have eight uh, nursing homes in outbreak, uh, 10 residential care facilities, one congregate leaven, and one correctional facility. Uh, clusters, we have um, three child clairs and one, one K through 12 school. And the K through 12 school will be adults, staff, or what is that? So that is, um, it's one of our high schools and it's, it's probably ready to come off pretty okay. soon. It takes 28 days for, okay. um, for it to be removed from the list and that, that's assuming there's no other cases that, that have occurred. Um, so this next slide, this is new, new that I haven't presented before. So looking at 2020 from um, uh, January 2020 all the way to December 31st, um, our total deaths to total cases was 186 deaths to 11,053 cases. Uh, that works out to about a 1.6 per 8% um, total deaths to total cases. Um, when we just look at our long-term care facility deaths, there was 109 deaths to 508 cases in long-term care facilities. If we back that out and we just look at general population, so folks that weren't in the long-term um, care facilities, um, it was 77 deaths to 10,545 cases, which comes out to about 0.73%. And so for 2020, long-term care facility deaths were 109, and that's out of 186 deaths, so it comes to 58%. Deaths, all deaths by age group, we had 123 um, deaths that were 75 and older. Between 65 and 74, there was 37 deaths. 55 to 64, 19. 40 to 54, four. And 20 to 39 years of age, there were three. Looking at 2021, since January 1, we've had a total of 45 deaths out of 4,931 cases at a 0.91% uh, rate. For our long-term care facilities, looking at those cases, there was 23 deaths out of 205 cases in long-term care facilities. Again, if we back that out and just look at general population, um, 22 deaths out of 470, um, 4,726. So a 0.47% there. And then out of overall deaths, uh, 23 out of 45 deaths were in the long-term care facility, so at 51%. And then when we look at age groups, but all deaths to, to date from January 1, 35 or 75 and older, seven were 65 to 74, one from 55 to 64, and then two from 20 to 39. So I know, I know this chart is hard to see, I apologize. Um, this graph is actually on the NCDHS website and it's updated daily um, at noon. I can tell you at 11.59 every day I'm hitting refresh on my computer consistently. <laughs> and why? Because it shows me how many people are vaccinated in Alamance County and I get excited when I see that number go up and up. So um, I'm, I'm like a little kid at Christmas at 11.59 p.m. <laughs> Um, so first dose shots in Alamance County as of February 15th, 17,610. So we are at 10.39% of our population. So out of that 17,610, 68% um, are 65 and older. So that comes out to about 11,000, almost 12,000. Um, if you remember previous meetings, 
I've said our 65 and older population is about 17.1% or 29,000 residents in Alamance County. So that puts us about 41% of the way there, getting our folks 65 and older That's vaccinated. So we are making progress. And when I say we, it's not only the health department, we have partners in the communities I'll talk about here in a little bit that are assisting with that, that effort. As for the health department, um, we have received our allocation, 9,395 was our received allocation. Um, on that chart, it says 10,051, but as we were sitting in this meeting, I got the updated numbers. So as of the update, 10,408 first doses were administered. So we continue to get extra doses out of those vials. And then for our second doses, we're at 5,428 second doses have been given by the health department and in the state, 7,982 for Alamance County, according to state data. So again, our, our mission here is shots and arms, safety and efficiency. Um, kind of looking back a little bit, last week, um, we worked with one of the local pharmacies. Um, they had an allocation of 100 uh, vaccines and 70 of those vaccines we were able to get from um, school, school teachers, um, folks that work in the school and child care employees that are 65 and older start their vaccination. So that pharmacy helped out and able started that process. Um, we transferred 200 extra doses to two local pharmacies. Um, one of those um, pharmacies is working with Burlington Housing Authority um, and working with our marginalized, um, our historically marginalized populations. And they're actually going, they're also working with UNC and they're actually gonna go door to door um, and make sure folks 65 and older are vaccinated. So they were very appreciative to um, receive the vaccine that we transferred over. Um, and then we transferred another 100 doses over to another pharmacy and that's just so they can focus on 65 and older population. We received or will be receiving our baseline allocation and 200 additional doses this week, which comes out to 1,175 doses, which has been consistent with the previous weeks. Moving into the future is a big question mark. Um, I, I feel confident that we'll continue to get a similar amount, um, but I don't know what that is. Um, so stay tuned and um, hopefully we'll be able to continue to uh, push those vaccinations out. Um, the Johnson & Johnson, vaccine is scheduled to be reviewed on February 26th. So the FDA will be looking at that. And um, I pray a couple days later that gets approved and we can start getting that vaccine out to the supply chain. So these are more providers that were added this week. So again, it's good when we see providers being added. So once there's enough vaccine in the marketplace, these are other places where people will be able to go to get their vaccinations. Um, just this last week, um, Walgreens started uh, here in the county, two, two in Burlington, one in Graham and one in Mebane. Um And their goal is to do a hundred a day at all four locations, so uh, each week. So that, that's good. We've got more vaccine being distributed in our community. Cone is operating a facility, uh, BMOC site. They're doing about 200 per day right now. Piedmont Health Services out of their facility is giving about 500 doses a week. Um, and then Moan had, uh, Cohen has also had a mobile unit that they put out in the community um, and doing anywhere from 50 to 100 shots with the mobile unit, um, depending where they go. Is that in Alamance or in other counties? That's, or? A, that's in Alamance. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if they did in Rockingham and, and Greensboro as well. Yeah. So um, looking forward, so I, I continued to um, do have a need for, for medical personnel. So we're always in the market for volunteers or anyone that has a medical license to come and assist. Um, we're fortunate the city of Mebane is starting to send their firefighters to us, which, which is great. We've had some in and out from some National Guard troops, but they do keep coming when, when they, one gets deployed out of the county. We do have been getting some replacements. We actually have a group coming from Chatham County um, this Thursday and Friday to, or just, excuse me, this Tuesday and Thursday to help out. Um, NC Baptist on a mission um, started assisting today and then of course any other volunteers from the community from our father uh, our pharmacies our medical practices retired RNs um, anybody that we can get we're happy to have come on site and assist us in giving those vaccinations out um, so we're, we're readying we're readying our first dose operations at the Eric Lane site um, so this Friday will actually be the walkthrough and then we'll start testing 
kind of our processes there to make sure they run efficient. Um, this will be with Cone. We're looking to partner with Cone and they'll be assisting us there. Um, they've actually been picking up the costs on some of the outfit there, um, the internet, the outfit is with the furniture, the tables and the chairs, uh, the cleaning services, security, not only the, the cameras and the alarms that go into the building, but um, traffic to help direct traffic, but also direct people inside the building. So they're actually gonna pick up the cost for those for those things. I happened to stop by there today. It was like a bunch of ants walking around, that, running around that place. <laughs> A lot of commotion. hard to get it done. Yes, sir. Don't you take your tents down every day? <coughs> put them back up every day at CTEC? So not not the tents. The tents are, are a temporary permanent structure per se, but we break everything down as far as the heaters, the generators, all the equipment gets broken down, boxed up, put in a trailer, trash thrown away. I mean, I, all the all the pieces to move that around. So that's done every day, not only at SeaTac, but at, at the stadium site. So that's a whole lot of time. A lot. Big, big deal. It's, it's about it's about 45 minutes to an hour to set up and then break down same same amount of time. So. Maybe after this is over, they can have like reality shows of health departments <laughs> racing on how to put up and take down <laughs> sites like the firemen do and they climb all this stuff. Y'all could win. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so again, um, lo looking forward, uh, we're hoping more providers will enroll with the state um, to help us give the vaccine when there's more into the marketplace. Um, as I mentioned previously, our partnership with Cone, again, the mission there, more shots in arm, an efficient and integrated process with our Cone partners and strategic communication to reach out to our store and uh, to now communication and reach to our historically marginalized populations. Um, next Saturday, we'll be supporting Piedmont Health Services and the General State Baptist Convention at the stadium site. Um, they're going to put on an event, do anywhere from three to 500 um, vaccinations there. So we're going to be out there and supporting that effort. Um, so the last thing I had to talk about was the governor, governor's and the secretary's announcement last week about um, moving the state uh, moving to group three um, on February 24th for schools and child care and then to essential workers on March 10th. So um, it was made clear that this again is dependent on the supply um, that we receive. Um, again, demand is truly outpacing supply. However, um, I was able to work with my team and we have been able to come up with a tentative plan um, right now of using our extra doses, which equates to about 350 to 450 doses per week um, to be able to start vaccinating the schools and the child cares um, after February 24th to start that process um, to be determined on the schedule this far and then um, start working our way through gr that group. Again, this is all dependent and assumes no additional vaccine or no um, the, a constant vaccine in the marketplace. It doesn't assume a, an increase. If we have an increase, great. We can just move people that much faster through the process. Um, it also doesn't assume a new vaccine entering the marketplace for the Johnson & Johnson one, which I'm really alluding to. Um, so anyways, that plan is tentative to, to start that um, cohort of that population. And that is all I have, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Has the state indicated to you that they will increase the uh, vaccine available to us with the increased groupings that they're allowing us to vaccinate? So, no. Um, no indication of that it's it's been uh, the only indication that we have um, was really our our baseline guarantee that we have up to this week and after that's kind of the we just don't know um i know and i'll be honest but i don't think the state does quite yet either what their next month allocation is be as they move into, into march so it just sounds really hopeful it's getting better and better you can mm -hmm. data don't lie so well i personally want to say well, I was out at the site uh, last Monday. Uh, I have never seen any operation any smoother. Uh, you drive up, station one, everything's checked. Nobody gets in that's not, not already pre-screened. Uh, you go to station two, station three, everything is just like clockwork. Uh, and even down to the how long you have to wait depending on which vaccine. Uh, extremely well done and we want to thank you thank you absolutely definitely mr chairman i had a quick question if I might. yes sir you mentioned that 
So on February 24th, 300 vaccines. Those are 300 that are dedicated to teachers and child care workers? Correct. That'll be our, our extra doses. So those extra doses that we don't aren't accounted for right. in the normal allocation. Will there be a separate method for, method for teachers and child care workers to call in and establish appointments for those separate vaccines? Yeah. So we'll do it very similar to how we did the, the health care worker. So I have a team currently working with ABSS, the private schools, um, and the child care workers. And what they're doing now is putting the list together, not only lists with their names, but it has all their registration information on there. So they're gathering all that information. That'll give us an idea how many we need to vaccinate um, in the county. So as soon as we have that, we'll have a list and, we'll, and it will be very controlled and calculated as we bring, the, bring those folks in. So no, they, they will not be, um, we're working through their employers. They won't have to call into the appointment line to make an appointment. Mr. Chairman, what is it like, 1,400 teachers? Mm-hmm. About 2,000. 2,000 teachers. So we, we es I estimate about 30, 3,600 will get the vaccine. Um, there's about 3,500 in ABSS. Um, That's like cafeteria staff. All the, yeah, this is, a, this is not teachers. This is all the staff in the right. school. 580 from the private schools and 1,062 um, from child care. And so we're operating off, that, that number comes out to about 5,142. We're estimating about 70% of that population will probably get their, their vaccination based on some recent studies. So it's about 10, 12 weeks. About, I'll calculate nine weeks, all things being equal. Yeah. Yeah. For one dose? For the first dose. For the first dose, yeah. Yeah. And of course, Johnson Johnson is calling for just one dose, is that correct? That is correct. We had a, an email from a gentleman. He's 74. He's starting to get a little. Well, Nancy, he's, he's, I've been calling, like, I mean, he's called and called and called and just could not get through and you could just start to hear the anxiety and the fear come in there. And I was in my drugstore, South Court Drug, um, and he, Kent was telling me that they're starting to do that. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is wonderful. So I gave him the number to them to get on and he goes the 1st of March. So he's going to get a shot. It's, the more places, it's so much better. Don't put everything on the backs of you guys. I know that you and, and IT and the county manager and myself, all of us have talked about scheduling. Um, and right now it's pretty much first come, first serve on the telephone calls if you meet the grouping requirements. Is there any way to allow people in advance? Um, and IT is working on that now and saying, so that we can do it both on computer or uh, you know, through the internet and on the phone. How is that going? Uh, it's going well. Uh, we had another meeting today. We have a scheduled meeting with Forsyth County. We, we, as I talked last time, we've gone into seeing if we could do it in-house versus using an outside uh, source. We honed in on Acuity, which is a software package that we're looking at that Guilford County and Forsyth. Whoa. Um, and uh, so I got two teams. Half my gosh. A third of my staff is doing both at the same time. It's not about necessarily the, um, you know, we're still looking at the software package, but also in house, it's also about when you deal with 400,000 calls, the same is true for websites. And so every part of that process has got to be vetted and make sure it's correct. So we're doing, we're doing all that. I, I think we could do something, a uh, scheduling thing very soon. It's, it's all those other pieces, just like when, um, to get a phone call, we had to make sure we had the capacity to handle phone calls. So, yeah. So, hopefully by this week we're in one basket so we can do those resources together. We're going as fast as we possibly can. The governor threw us a little curve with the 24th, going yet another phase that's putting in the mix, but still not having enough vaccines. So we're going as fast as we can. But uh, luckily, the call center, even with 400,000, didn't go down. So it's been working every time. So. And that was in one day. That was like the first Monday, I think. Isn't that correct? When it went to uh, the new the 65 plus. We got yeah, 187,000 so calls. Plus. Now, that it did go down a lot since then, but that first day was a record for us. I mean, 400,000 calls in one day. Calls. Almost, yeah. Yes, now, that 387,000. Again, that could be somebody calling 50 times. That's true. <laughs> 74. Right. And so. <laughs> And what I would also say is, you know, a lot of people call in that first hour and maybe they give up and then toward the end of the day, it's a lot less 
folks. So I'd say try again later in the, in the end of the day. We'll see the numbers every hour. So, and I'm seeing all around us the same kind of problems. It's a supply and demand situation. We again, we welcome uh, the different uh, pharmacies and folks that are doing it, and we're very excited for the partnership with Cone. Hopefully, that brings more vaccines. So we can give them out. And a big shout out, we're now orange. We're not red anymore. Yeah. Tony, mm -hmm. so I got one question. What time is the walkthrough on Friday? It's not a big deal. You can get back. Got, gotcha, I'll yeah. It's around two or three, but yeah. I'll see you <laughs> but we don't want a thousand people out for the walkthrough. <laughs> 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 uh, hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Now let's try to go to elections. <laughs> Thank you, commissioners. I'm standing in for Kathy Holland this evening for her budget amendment. Uh, you have in your packet a request for a budget amendment to the Board of Elections budget in the dollar amount of $144,486. These are uh, HAVA grant funds uh, that elections can use for various technological improvements. There are no, lo uh, no local matching funds are required to accept these. Uh, we're recommending that the commissioners amend the Board of Elections budget by $144,486. And you can see in your packet the various uses that uh, the Board of Elections can make with these funds, technological uses, uh, worker training. Um, Kathy is, and her folks are gearing up for the municipal elections this fall. So they are getting ready, and I'm sure these funds will come in handy. Uh, it's very likely we may still be social distancing and doing some of these things that we went through in the November election. So we were pleased to see this come in and uh, ho hopefully she can put it to good use. Motion to approve. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. So the second budget amendment you have in your packet proposes to amend the current uh, fiscal year 2021 jail budget by $1,012,500. This is the estimated cost to manage the ICE program uh, operated by the uh, Alamance County Sheriff's Office from February 1st until June 30th. So this is the dollar amount that uh, we're uh, estimating it will cost to uh, run the ICE program from February 1 to June 30th. Uh, it's important to note that the ICE expenditures are completely offset by ICE revenue. So this program, while it uh, is proposed to spend a little over a million dollars, will bring in that same dollar amount to cover those costs uh, where there are no county dollars in the ICE uh, program. So we estimate the total annual cost. The, the program is funded by the federal government on an annual basis from February to February. We're estimating that from February of 2021 to February of 2022, the ICE program will cost $2,463,750. And what we'll plan to do is as part of the upcoming budget process uh, for fiscal year 21-22, we will propose to add $1,451,250 to the ICE program, offset by additional ICE revenues that will take this program for the entire year. So what's being proposed tonight is to amend the jail's budget just to get the ICE program through June 30th. Then budget time, the budget will include um, the additional $1.4 million. So this time, I'm I asked the sheriff if he has anything to add or wants to comment on this uh, budget amendment. No, we just, uh, you know, we're moving forward with the program, and uh, I think we're very lucky with uh, the uh, state of our nation to be able to uh, get another year contract with Immigration and Customer Enforcement. Now, every county doesn't have this program, right? No, ma'am. How there many is. of these programs are in the state of North Carolina? There's, there's some, age, we're the only 72, over 72 hour holding facility in North Carolina. So your transportation things, that's going to be folks coming from all over the state to here and possibly then going somewhere else. That's correct. Okay. We, we, we will pick them up, bring them here, dip them here, they'll either go to Atlanta or somewhere to... to and you go to Atlanta also? No, Did you? we don't take them. Okay. The Marshall bus comes, I mean the uh, ICE bus picks them up and okay. take them wherever they're going. Okay. Now this means that the funding that comes in from ICE is used for the ICE detainees, and the ICE detainees are people that have been illegally entered the United States, 
and have been convicted of a crime. That's correct. Not necessarily from Alamance County at all. No, sir. We, we go far as uh, 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 Dare County, we pick them up Dare County down on the coast to, to the mountains, uh, uh, Raleigh, Charlotte, etc. But uh, these are people that are, have come illegally and have violated our laws uh, and can be, been convicted. So they're not just arrested, it's done as far as the okay. case mm -hmm. and conviction stands. Okay, sorry Steve. I think from some of the emails we've seen there's some confusion that this might be similar to the old 287G program, but this doesn't Absolutely. have anything to do we, with that. We do not go out with ICE and pick people up. We transport them after they've already been taken into custody in other parts of the state, processed, brought to our detention center. Most of them don't stay here more than uh, 24 to 48 hours, and then they're transported out. And this money is solely for this. It doesn't branch out in other areas. Like, like food services and ABSS, that is federal. You can't touch it in no other part of the whole school system. So this is in its own entity as well. So that's right. It's paid for the okay. ICE program. Any other questions? I'll move we approve it. Second. Thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. Is Mr. Carter the only other speaker? Yes. We All right. Bruce, do you see anybody yeah, on the queue? On the Mr. Carter? I have one question um, before I come up to the dais. Am I allowed to give you anything uh, for you to look at while I'm speaking? I don't know of any prohibition, Mr. Mm -hmm. Albright. That's up to the board. There are, I, I there think that would be fine. One to go this way and one to go that way. So That will be fine. Do you have enough for Thomas? Uh, he can have them after it's done. Okay. Um, at, at the last opportunity I had to speak, um, I made a, I, I referred to it as hyperbole in that I compared um, what was happening in the United States uh, to the situation in, in Germany. When Germany lost the war, they made sure that there was no demonstration of, of victory um, or they did not promote the Third Reich at all. They made sure that there were no statues erected. And I believe that that, that has, uh, has merit as it relates to when we're looking at the United States. The South lost the war. And I, I can't see why we continue to put up the statues. So I'll look at it. I'll continue with my, with my discussion. Reasonable people can agree that what actually should be done with the statues in the United States are the same thing that Germany did. They did not allow statues to be erected in Germany to, to support or up, uplift the Third Reich. And the, and the correct Confederate statues sit in that same category as far as I'm concerned. And a lot of people in the United States believe the same thing. Um, in the meantime, you that sit on the dais use 100.2 or dash 2.1 as a reason not to take that down and that's similar whatever you want to call it similar similar uh what do they call it similar prominence there's a different way to look at similar similar prominence a tall statue in front of a courthouse is not necessarily similar prominence you can have a statue in a church and it is similar prominence I look at it as another instance where we put our, our foot on the neck of people. Like last week when I, when I left here, someone said, why are you upset? Why don't you just not look at the statue? Why don't you just not look at it? Don't see it. This is what I see. And what I see is this statue right here. But there's some people in the county who see this. They see that. They see that when they look at the statue. When they look at the statue, they also see that. 
they see that instead of a person standing on a, on, on a pedestal. They also see that instead of someone standing on a pedestal. That's something we ought to consider. Not everybody sees it as a statue. And lastly, most recently, they see this. A lot of Americans see that instead of the statue. That's the problem with what we're, what, why we're faced with what we have in the United States today. I have no disrespect for the dais. I look at the forgotten cause as something that we need to put in our history. And um, I'm done. I let my three minutes get away from me again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sir. But I think I made my point. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Master Chief. Okay. I understand there are no other speakers, is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Oh, are there any uh, commissioner responses? There being none, county manager. Uh, just a quick, quick report. You do have in your packet a fiscal report. Um, just to hit the highlights of this information, it includes county information, school system, and the community college. But I wanted to point out uh, a few things, particularly on the revenue front. Our property tax revenues are coming in about $2.3 million higher than fiscal year 1920, which is great news. We budgeted for a $2.4 million increase. So we, we feel like we projected pretty well, uh, but the, the revenues are coming in from property taxes as we expected. Sales tax revenue, uh, we've, we've received through November. Uh, the, the November sales are in, so that is accounted to us in February. So February of uh, 2020 versus February of 21, we've seen a 9.1% increase, which is fantastic. Uh, fiscal year 1920 versus fiscal year 2021, th both fiscal years through February. Uh, fiscal year 2021, we've seen an 11.7% increase. Again, fantastic news. And the COVID months, uh, which we're considering to be March of 2020 through uh, November of 2020 because these sales tax receipts came from November versus March of 19 through November of 19 is a 6.62 percent increase in sales tax revenue. All of this is good news, much better than our uh, uh, 20 percent decrease that we projected would happen to sales tax revenue. So at this point, sales tax revenue is coming in very strong, and that is excellent. Uh, we're watching other revenues, uh, particularly our EMS revenue revenues from library and parks due to their being closed uh, and several of their programs stopped. We're watching our detention revenues as well as DSS and we're also watching our uh, investment revenues uh, to keep an eye on those to see how they're going to come in for the fiscal year. Something I would put uh, in the commissioner's minds to consider that there were several things that we did not fund this year, additional things that we did not fund that we may want to start thinking about as sales tax revenue continues to come in strong. This includes parks and library operations. We are coming up on uh, youth baseball season. We did not fund the youth baseball program. Uh, we'll, we'll need to be talking about whether or not we want to try to budget some of this additional sales tax revenue that's coming in above budget for that program. Uh, maybe even at our next meeting, I understand from Brian Baker that they're gonna need to make a decision fairly soon about whether or not to offer youth baseball in the spring. I think they feel like they could offer it, but we, we didn't budget for it. So we may need to talk about that. Also, as we continue into the fiscal year, if we keep seeing these sales tax revenues come in this strong versus what we thought was going to happen, we may want to give some thought to uh, putting funds back in our own capital improvement plan. We usually budget $250,000 a year to make repairs to county buildings. We did not do that in this fiscal year as part of the budget reduction. Something to think about, as well as our capital equipment. We didn't fund our capital equipment program for this fiscal year. It's where we usually buy our um, sheriff cars, ambulances, those kinds of vehicles. My thought would be, if we keep seeing these strong sales tax revenues come in, if we think we can afford to buy some of that equipment now, that might help us in the next uh, budget year, right. try to keep us from being two years behind. And, and we may want to consider uh, putting some money back into farmland preservation. If you'll recall, commissioners, I think we had normally budgeted $150,000 for that program. I believe mm -hmm. we took it to 75,000. So very successful. They make great use of that money. If the money's coming in as strong uh, as it seems to be, those are things we may want to consider budgeting some of this additional sales tax revenue to cover. 
I would suggest that with the exception of the athletic program for the Parks Department, we might be looking at April, May time frame. If we keep seeing the strong uh, dollars come in, uh, you may see me come to you with some suggestions about what we could bring back out of those, uh, those categories. I do think uh, you may hear from me next meeting about the Parks um, Youth Baseball Program. So, uh, well, well just for context, too, <clears throat> I'll, I'll say that what happened last year, when we got a lot of pushback from a lot of citizens about the youth programs being cut in the budget, when in fact the governor had actually cut, had, had, had blocked the uh, implementation of the program. So that That's made it logical for us to take it out of the budget because he wasn't going to allow the programs to be in, implemented. So if, if he's going to allow it, then I think definitely we need to consider putting that back in for this, the balance of this year so we can allow the kids to I'd like get to out of the say, house. Yeah, I'd also like to say I was on that Recreation and Parks Board gosh, since 2013 or 2014 continuously. I took myself off uh, because of the duties with the chair, but uh, Ms. Thompson, I think you're on that board now. Uh, but that needs to be implemented as quickly as possible because they've got to start their teams and preparing, training, all kinds of things have to happen. And we can't wait. Well, it's two weeks to our next meeting. I would really encourage us as a board to go ahead and implement that as, as quickly as possible. I think uh, Mr. Baker, the Parks Director, has indicated to me if he has some idea of the March 1st meeting, I think that would give them enough time. Uh, they're, they're working on what that program would look like. They did not. Um, if I remember correctly, we did not offer you football. I think we offered a scaled-down version of the basketball program, a pod-type program, social distancing the works. Uh, I think they're trying to figure out what would be the most appropriate form of baseball and softball to bring back and offer for the kids. Um, so I, I, I think from my, my take from Mr. Baker would be if, at the March 1st meeting, I'll have some dollar figures from him that I can bring to you that I would – uh, propose if we still see these good uh, sales tax revenue coming in to cover those costs with the sales tax revenue that has come. The other the other items, while very important, uh, we may want to wait until April just to make sure this trend. I mean, I, I feel certain that we are trending very well in sales tax. Um, my hope had been to have six to seven months of good sales tax data under our belts before we bring any of these type of things back. But I feel like these are ones that very important to our community. Uh, farmland preservation is one of the pillars of our strategic plan, and, and we're, we're, we're it in Alamance County that is working actively to preserve farmland. So it'd be very nice to bring, bring some of these uh, items back. But again, I think you'll, you'll hear from me next meeting about the um, baseball softball program, and then probably an April, May timeframe on these others. And uh, just wanted to bring you up to speed on, on how we're doing financially. So. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have a quick question. Yes, sir. Mr. Mr. Egan, how are we doing on uh, property tax realizations? So uh, we've, we've brought in, I think I said, uh, maybe $2.3 million above where we were last year, which is good news. We, what we've seen in the past is our base has grown approximately 3%. So as you know, the uh, tax rate stayed the same in uh, 2021. So we're bringing in additional revenue, but we budgeted for that. I'll make sure everybody understands that was that was planned. We, we thought that would probably happen. We budgeted for it. So we're very close to hitting the dollar amount that we thought we would hit uh, with property tax. But if you break it down to percentages of folks who have paid and folks who are late, do you know if, if, if we're behind in that metric? That I don't know. I can uh, certainly get with Jeremy and, and share that information with you um, after this meeting. I'd be happy to. But I, I'm, I don't know off the top of my head how things are going. Uh, and I don't know if Jeremy's here. I know he usually attends, but not, not here. Numbers, for sure. Yes. Yeah. I'm just wondering if the if the tide is lifting because there's more folks, you know, to pay property tax, or if, you know, if, if enough if the same amount of people are are still same percentage of people are still paying. Susan or Andrea, I don't know if, if y'all have had discussions with Jeremy recently about this and giving shed any light. I'm, I'm ha I will certainly reach out to him. I know if he was here, he could comment on it. But uh, I don't know if anyone's had any conversation with Jeremy that might uh, we've been talking to Jeremy just in planning for next year and um, he actually gave a report to the board from the fall talking about how people seem to be paying um, on time I think he's got some updated information that he'd be able to share 
I'll, I'll query him and share that with you um, uh, after this meeting tonight. One other thing I'd like to just um, inquire about possibly, or maybe just for us as a group to think about, when I was on the board in 2014, uh, we gave a, and I've forgotten the percentage, maybe a 2% discount for early pay by owner before August 1st. Um, I'm not sure that wouldn't be a good thing to at least look at again. I'd want to know the numbers before I'd be for or against such a proposition, but uh, yeah, the earlier we bring in money, we can invest it. Uh, the taxpayers would receive a benefit from paying early. Um, and if it's even a wash, it looks like that might be a good idea. Well, look we have the man of the hour, right? Your ears must have been burning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll watch it on the screen downstairs. But there's a delay, so I'm sorry it took me a lot to get up here. From my perspective, it's 30 seconds to go. <laughs> so uh, you were talking about percentages? And Just come really to the podium, is. if you would, please, sir. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. I wasn't sure if I could approach. Um, it's very similar. Uh, we were actually slightly ahead going into December. I think we might be just a tiny bit off uh, right now, but I mean, neck and neck close. Uh, but really, we've, we've been leading by 2% most of the, the months up until uh, right now in February. And we're pretty much neck and neck, so. Yeah. Very well. <laughs> and Ms. Atkins, additionally, if, if you could kind of give us some numbers before we get into budget, um, the budget period in April, on what a discount early for early pay might save or cost us. Absolutely. Thank you. We'll do it. Mr. Chairman, I have a few questions. Yes, sir. Take, if you don't mind. You get it. Uh, Mr. Haygood, um, I'm looking at the property taxes here at the very top of this spreadsheet. The actual number, I just want to make sure that I'm looking at the numbers properly. You are giving us numbers here that pretty much give us an uh, indication of how the county is doing over seven months of the 12-month budget, correct? Yes. Okay. How often... I'm seeing here that we're $8.4 million under budget for our property taxes that we've collected. I'm looking at a number on the right-hand side that says 131-2020 of $89,332,000. So you are, uh, I do agree with you, you do are getting more tax revenues than you did last year. Right underneath it is a sales tax number. Um, year to date, it's 13, uh, excuse me, 15.39. So that, that's uh, about 1.9 million, like you said. How often do we get tax revenues past January 1st for property taxes? I mean, do, are people paying currently now? That happens daily, uh, weekly. I think our, um, well, I don't know, Susan, if you can. I guess my question, uh, Brian, is, uh, excuse me, Mr. Hager, is, um, I guess my question is, do you normally, uh, I know you said that you plan for the 3% uh, the, the, uh, increase. Uh, do you normally get to this time of year and you have um, you know, roughly 9% uncollected? You know, when you get to about the end of February, is that normal? I, I believe so, yes. yes. How often does, does that, um, I'm, I'm looking at your percentage of the budget, and uh, you know, just I'm just doing basic math. Seven divided by 12 is 58 percent, so everything under 58 percent would be underwater, correct? I think it some of this would depend on the timing, too. Some of these revenues are timed differently, but yes, can you explain to me what restricted intergovernment revenue is or for the, for the public? Because there is a large number here, and I'm just trying to figure out how we get to that. Yes, we have a definition in here that. It, most of that, if I'm not mistaken, is DSS mm -hmm. and health department specific. Yes. Some of the revenues are reimbursement. So in the unrestricted intergovernmental or the restricted governmental, mm -hmm. those are, um, a lot of those can be reimbursement related. Medicaid reimbursements or things like that. Some of them can be one time a year 
uh, settlements. We have cost settlements that happen in those categories. And so when we're, we are comparing year to year on our revenue categories, it helps to have some more detail on that, um, that breakdown. Sure. If you're interested in that, we can provide. Yeah, I'll just be curious to see how that um, those numbers come in because um, you know I can understand the sales tax number up, up top; it's right at the number. Um, but the 15.2 million dollars that you're under budget for the restricted our government, I was just curious: is is it just one of those things where things are just delayed and payments come in later down the road? And I guess my next question is to be: uh, as we all know in accounting, everything doesn't come to zero unless you square it out. Uh, do you, at the end of the year, you have your intergovernment uh, restricted, unrestricted intergovernment stuff? Does it, like, if you get to June 30th and you still have stuff that hasn't been been taken care of, do you uh, write that off, or do you look to bring that in into the next year? I'm, I'm just curious how this number is going to come back to us. So the restricted intergovernmental is also based on what um, DSS and the health department spend to. Mm -hmm. So I think. You know, in general, we usually have a lot of lap salaries in those two departments uh, because they have uh, they have some difficulty hiring, a lot of turnover. So if they don't spend it, we won't get the reimbursement, so that'll have some effect. Um, but yes, the, the, the timing has a lot to do with when okay. we'll receive this 15 points. I'll just keep, a lot, keep an eye on it, keep, sure. just take a look on it. And, and maybe, As will we, yes. Yes, indeed. And, and maybe just talk to your, your staff at some point. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ward, any other comments? Is this like we're done and we make a comment? Absolutely. Are we making comments just for our own or are we making a comment on Billy's comment? Because um. I'm not touching it. <laughs> 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 it's so over my head. Huh? We, we have just moved on to commissioner's comments. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. I just want to play by the rules. Uh, well, I have a quick one. And, um, and, and I, I just, I have a, a real special, I, I just, can't let go of our seniors that are passing away in rest homes and I mean I and I, I purposely did not do this right after our health department did because I didn't want this to attach to anything that they've done because this is just an issue that that is just it gets all over me um, just to share something with you because I'm, I'm gonna see the same principle in this and I'll be really quick I know some of us want to leave but back in 2009 there was a place in Carthage and it was Pine Lake Nursing Center and um, a lady worked there. She worked in the dementia part of the clinic and she had separated from her husband, bad domestic violence case. And he came to that center looking for her and he brought a double barrel shotgun. And he was after her in every kind of way. Well, she locked herself in the dementia aspect because it was a lockdown. But this guy went from room to room looking for her. And in each room, he, um, he killed a Jerry Avant, which was a 39-year-old former Coast Guard. He was a nurse there. He killed a Miss Deckler, who was 98, a Miss Dunn, who was 86, a Miss Garner, who was 75, a Miss Golson, who was 78, a Miss Hedrick, who was 78, uh, a Miss Johnson, who was 89, a Miss Musser, who was 88, and they were in their beds, or they were in a wheelchair out in the hall. And each time he shot them, he was shooting his wife, because he, he had just lost it. And the call goes out because there's somebody visiting their parent and they're in another place locked down with the door shut and hiding in a closet that called law enforcement. And a very young 19-year-old Justin Garner was hunting and he hadn't been on the police less than a year. And he went headstrong. And he went in that facility and he was told, he got there before anybody did, he's coming toward the front of the building because he just could not find his wife. And he come out after just shooting one of these patients in their bed. And this boy, he got shot in his foot by this guy. I'm not even going to mention his name. He was convicted. He was given the death penalty and he's no longer with us. And Justin shot him and he hit the floor. And 19 years old and was hunting and came in there. And see, this is so tragic because all these folks were in their beds, in their wheelchairs, just, just living there, whatever life they had. And they didn't ask for none of this. And, and I look and I, I talked to um, Tony today and 23 out of the 45 deaths since January 1 have been from rest homes. And, and I look at our numbers because last time, 213 they were like 200. Before that, now they're 228. Um, 
I just think this is as unacceptable as it gets. We, um, I see everybody, I was out at Walmart the other day and everybody and their mother was there. Everybody's all over the place. It looks like they're having a big sale. Who did I tell today? Was it, um, I know who it was. I said, why don't we make a motion to close Walmart? Then we'll really see how serious people are about being smart with COVID. And, and I hear about all these deaths of all these people. They just come and I, and I you know, y'all know I have their death certificates going to see all these lists of all these diseases that they have and then COVID just comes in and clobbers them. And just like the folks in our rest home facilities right now, where we've got eight cases, I think it's eight places, they're there. They don't bring COVID into themselves. It walks in the door. And, and there's no blame. It's just the sickest thing I've ever seen in my life. You know, there was a blame for this guy who went in and shot all these people. I had the chief, um, McKenzie, he come with Justin and they spoke at my Men for Change event that year when I was at Family Beast Services. And, and what they told me what they saw, the aftermath of like that was worse than any war they've ever been in. And this is a war. COVID is like a war to me because we keep losing these folks. These folks are the ones who have paved the way, their ages, they've been in wars, we don't even know what wars are, and they've paved the way for our freedoms. They paved the way for me to take my Bible to Starbucks and read it in public, not like China where you have to hide in some cave of fear of losing your life getting caught. We're so blessed in this country for the freedoms we have, but we've got to do better by this population because they're sitting ducks for this. And I don't know what we've got to do. And I'm so thankful those three directors came here. I saw their heartbreakingness, heartbreakingness in what they were saying because they take it really personal. But we're not stopping it. It's not changing. And so uh, as much as I want children back in school, I want them safe, they're our future. And we hear all this data and all this thing and, and I'm gonna work as hard as I can. I wanted them back last year. But the whole time we keep talking about everything, getting our vaccines and all this, everything, these folks are still dying every day in these rest home centers. And it's just unacceptable. And um, I, I, that's somebody's parents. Thank God for Janice Dean, who does the weather for Fox News, who stayed on Cuomo because of the things we found out now. Over 50% of the deaths in rest homes were not even reported. And that's, that's, that's prosecutable to me. That's all I'm gonna say. But um, we gotta figure out something better here. If we have to get a naval hospital and park it in the Hall River to put these people on it to keep them safe. It is worth that $24 million fund balance if we have to park it here because I am serious about this because this cannot be just the news it cannot be another set of numbers because we're getting numb to it because this is Parkland High School's weekend where they had the shooting down in Florida it was horrible it's horrible but these people are just as important they are the Parkland students they used to be students just like we were so I don't know what we have to do we have to look at this somehow whatever we've got to do but we have got to go to war for these people because this is a mom and a dad, an aunt and uncle, this is our families that are just writing them off and putting in the data. And I'm sorry, that is not gonna work. Not now in Alamance County, we are better than that. And so we gotta come up with a plan, whatever that is. And we gotta come up with it quick. We talk about baseball for young people, you daggum right, because they need it. These folks need their future because they're living there and they're paying big bucks to live there too. So um, that's all my comment. I just want to say thanks again to the health department after that remark. <laughs> you're doing a super, super job. And with the limited resources you have, you're really helping this county. Mm -hmm. it's Thank you. John, I got one comment. Yes, sir. Uh, just want to um, just want to make sure that we, uh, at the next meeting, March 1st, we're going to talk about um, zoning yes. for snow camp. Well, the only thing I would really like to ask the public to do is I would really like to have everyone who's concerned about snow cap for or against i want to hear both sides yep i want to hear from the people because i can see this thing from both sides and i've had lots of emails from folks so i can understand why they don't want it and i understand why they do want it and i would really like to bring this all out and let everyone in the public hear this is extremely important for our county uh whether we want to admit it or not uh zoning it's here for us we're going to have to take a step here and do something because if we don't decide how our county looks, someone's going to decide for us. And I would really like for our citizens to decide this and not someone else who's not from here. Good point. Thank you. Well, I want to also point out our next meeting is a public hearing. Mm -hmm. 
it's on that issue. So, and everybody out in the audience, we get this packet, and this is a small packet. The mm -hmm. agenda is printed every or published every Thursday prior to our meetings. Every Thursday. So we're up here looking at documents and considering numbers and so forth. We as board members have all seen them. We've studied those numbers. We've looked at the packet. But guess what? Everybody out in the, in the county is available to you as well. All you've got to do is just go on your computer and look at that agenda, not just the agenda, but the agenda packet. And it's in PDF form, it's in digital form, it's in multiple forms. If you don't look at it, there's not much more we can do to try to educate you as a public. Any other comments before we go into our other session? I'd like to move at this point that we go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute section 143-318.11, print A, print 6, to consider a personnel matter. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried. We're in executive session for, or excuse me, closed session. Um, we hope for a short period of time. We're back in session. We discussed a personnel matter in the closed session. Do you have any further motions? Motion to adjourn. Second. Any discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye and aye. leaving. Aye. 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 Thank you, John. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.